Welcome, good to see everybody. If you have your bulletin, please grab the bulletin insert because there are some fill-ins, some things hopefully you'll find uh, helpful and instructive. Going to be talking about Samson today, pointing out a few things, looking at some misconceptions about Samson. Samson was, was both a political leader and a judicial leader. He was a judge in Israel. But Samson, because of his indiscretions, his personal weaknesses, he was not able to do what God wanted him to do. God wanted him to deliver Israel from the Philistines, and he could not, he did not, because of his habits and his faults and his flaws that kept getting in the way. Israel was on a slippery slope, and we see through time that the Hebrew people would turn their backs on God. They would turn their backs on the scriptures that they had been given. A few weeks ago, we celebrated the United States of America and our foundings, but we are, America is on a slippery slope right now. This week, the FBI and the Department of Justice made up law. We've had in the past the Supreme Court making up law. Lobbyists who make up law. The White House, the Senate, they make up laws. Now, under our Constitution, that is given to the House of Representatives. They propose the law, they send it over to the Senate, and the Senate was designed to slow things down. They, they kind of liken it to the saucer under a coffee cup, that in the heat of the House, where there are a lot more people, they get all excited about things, and then the Senate it just kind of cools down, and when it spills over, it goes into the cup. And then once they agree on a piece of legislation, it's supposed to go to the White House and either be signed or rejected, vetoed. And there are things in place for the laws to be properly introduced, agreed on, and executed. I would like to propose a new law. I don't think it will ever see the light of day. <laughs> But I would like to call it the pants on fire law. <laughs> Whenever an elected official starts telling a lie, that their pants catch on fire. Probably never see it, but I think it would probably help in our discourse a little bit. 
Martin Sampson, seven stupid steps sliding on a slippery slope. And I think we'll be able to see some things, some parallels with our own lives in a few minutes. This week is VBS. I hope you're uh, excited about it. Now, for those that aren't familiar with VBS, the children have programs that are age appropriate, and the adults will have a program, uh, not so much songs and, and that type of thing, but the, the scripture that we study will be similar to what the children are studying. So when you go home with the children, you can ask them what they learned, and you can have some guidance to kind of walk them through it. Because now there's an old game called telephone years and years ago where you start in a big circle and you tell somebody and it kind of gets mixed up by the end. And, you know, when children retell Bible stories, sometimes the facts get a little bit askew. Some of these you might have heard before, but I, these are uh, some of my favorites. The three, first three books of the Bible are Genesis, Exodus, and Laxatives. <laughs> Noah's wife was called Joan of the Ark. Lot's wife was a pillar of salt by day and a ball of fire by night. I had missed that when I was reading it. Joshua led the Hebrews in the Battle of Jericho. Some of us have been there. David fought with the Finkelsteins, a race of people who lived in biblical times. Solomon, one of David's sons, had 300 wives and 700 porcupines. And then the last one I have here, Samson slayed the Finkelsteins with the axe of the apostles, and he pulled down the pillows of the temple. <laughs> Kids goof things up a little bit sometimes, but you know, that's all part of the learning process. We goof things up thing, uh, too. But one of the things, again, about the design is to be able to all of us learn an area of scripture and then share our thoughts about it. Let's bow our heads in a word of prayer before we get started. Lord, we just pray that you take now the story of Samson and the scripture, and we pray that we can apply it to our lives. We can see the mistakes that Samson made and not repeat those mistakes in our own lives. We pray that you give us grace. We pray that you give us clarity of thought. In your name we ask these things. Amen. Now, there's a misconception about Samson, and I've dealt with it before, but I just want to hit it again quickly. Samson, now this is not Samson, this is the former governor of California. People think that Samson was this big, strong guy. But think about this for a second. Why did Delilah uh, try and find out where the source of his strength was? If I'm looking at this guy, now I'm not the smartest guy in the world, but if I'm looking at this guy, I'm not going to question where the source of his strength comes from. All right? Now this guy here? Yeah, because we say at one time, Samson grabbed the gates of the city, the large gates, and those things were like 14 to 16, and carried them up a hill. And so... And again, we look at this guy, yeah, we know where his strength comes from. If this guy is doing amazing acts of strength, then we've got to figure out, well, where is that coming from? Samson was on a, a slippery slope. God had a definite plan and vision for Samson and the Hebrew people, but Samson had some fatal flaws that he refused to properly deal with. We all have flaws, we all have weaknesses, but our success depends on whether we deal with those weaknesses successfully or we let them get the better of us. Today we're going to focus on Samson as we seek to deal with our own fatal flaws. In October 1939, Winston Churchill's famous quotation made a statement about Russia in a radio broadcast. And they were talking about the war and whether Russia was going to come into the war. Here's the quote. I cannot forecast you, I cannot forecast to you the action of Russia. It is a riddle wrapped in a mystery inside an enigma. Now, there wasn't a, a direct references, but there are a, a thing from Russia called a babushka doll, and they would have a bunch of dolls all looking the same, but they'd be smaller and then they would stack on top 
of one another. Sometimes they just called a Russian nesting doll. But it was a riddle inside a mystery, inside a puzzle. If you're a fan of the TV show Steinfeld, Jerry and Elaine once described Newman as a mystery wrapped in a riddle, wrapped in a twinkie. <laughs> Samson was truly a riddle inside a mystery inside a puzzle because he had everything he needed to do what God wanted him to do. He had all the resources in his hands, but yet he was unsuccessful doing what God wanted him to do. We don't have time to hit all the highlights or the lowlights of Samson's life this morning, but I want to touch on a couple of significant things. Samson's feats are leg legendary, but it's his flaws that proved to be fatal. His two greatest weaknesses were revenge and women. In fact, his weakness for women often led him on the road to revenge. He was extremely gifted, but not always godly. He was strong on the outside, but lacked control on the inside. The period of Judges lasts over 365 years. Before they had a king, they had judges. That was God's plan in the land. And it started back with Moses, when Moses' father-in-law said, hey, these people are too much for you. You need to appoint some people that will help you. And when they have a dispute, when they have a problem, they can come to one of these individuals. And then the stuff that's very, very difficult, have them bring that to you. Some of the well-known judges that we've known in, in our, our Bible stories in our Sunday school, Joshua was a judge, Gideon was a judge, uh, Samuel, the prophet Samuel, he was the last judge because he's the one that appointed King David. During this entire period of 365 years, there were 17 different judges. Now, some led the, the Jewish people for decades, others for a very short amount of time. Many are unaware that the judge just before Gideon was a woman named Deborah. Now, guys in the Monday Night Bible Study would notice that Paul did not mention that there was a woman judge over the men of Israel for many, many years. Forty years there was peace in Israel because Deborah was a wise and knowledgeable judge. She was a righteous judge. The book of Judges goes into great detail of some of the judges, and if you want to read more about Deborah, that's in uh, chapters 4 and 5 of Joshua. Samson was the 13th judge that had been in Israel. Now, sometimes we read about these Bible stories and we think, boy, I could, I, could never, I could never be like that. We read about Gideon or Joshua and some of the fantastic things they did. And, but, but many of us have tools in our hands. We have abilities, and we don't use them to their fullest potential. In some ways, Samson is not like us, but in some ways, he was very much like us. All of us know what it means to be tempted. All of us struggle at times with a desire for revenge. We've been there, we understand, and when we see Samson struggling and falling, part of us says, yeah, don't. Why would you do that? But other parts of us say, yeah, boy, you know, I've, I've struggled and failed the Lord too. The truth of the matter is there's a little bit of Samson in all of us, and there's a whole lot of Samson. One of the things we learned from Samson's life is sin will always take us further than we want to go, and it will always drag us deeper than we want to go. I can remember a number of years ago, a fairly contentious pastor's meeting uh, up north, and there was some problems in, and a cantankerous old coot got up and said some very unkind things about a fellow pastor. And the pastor who had been talked about got up. It was his turn to talk. And he was the target of the unkind remarks. And he just quite calmly said, Now I know how the Philistines felt in, Ju in Judges chapter 15 when they were slain by the jawbone of a donkey. And then he went on with what he was doing. 
Seven stupid steps sliding on a slippery slope. Quickly, I want to begin with uh, important information from uh, chapter 13. The scripture says, again, the Israelites did evil in the sight of the Lord. And so the Lord delivered them into the hands of the Philistines for 40 years. They were subjects of the Philistines. They were no longer free people. Numbers 6 describes three commitments of a Nazarite. Uh, God, step back a second, God decided something needed to be done. He appears to a man and a woman, said to the woman, you're going to have a child. You wanted a child for years. I'm going to give you a child. You're going to name him Samson. He's going to be a Nazarite, and he will deliver Israel from the Philistines. Now, number six describes what a, a Nazarite must do during the keeping of his vow. Avoid any contact with grapes or the drinking of wine. Never touch a dead body of any kind. And let your hair grow and never get it cut. That was three of the requirements for a Nazarite vow. And Samson was born specifically to deliver Israel. As we go through the story, we'll discover in reality he never did any delivering because he never was able to deliver himself from his weaknesses and his flaws. And since uh, he never dealt with his own flaws, the scripture says he only began to deliver Israel. See, Samson was set apart and he was stirred by the Spirit of God. He had everything he needed within his power to accomplish his task. He was both energized and equipped. And compared to other biblical heroes, he had more going for him than anybody else. And yet he let it all slip through his fingers. The man in the scripture with the greatest physical strength also had the greatest character weaknesses. All right, chapter 14, and if you have your, your fill-ins, First one, I want you to see, and we're going to go through these quickly. Samson went to the wrong place. Judges chapter 14, verse 1. Samson went down to Timnah. The writer is telling us two things in that little phrase. First, he's telling us something about geography. Timnah was in Philistine territory, was in enemy territory, about four miles down the hill, very significant there, from Samson's village. But it was a decline. He went down into Timnah, and he went down in his spiritual life. In his first public act, he leaves the land of Israel for enemy territory. He leaves the land of God's promise for the land of sin. To put it bluntly, Samson left God's people and headed south spiritually. The second thing, he was looking for the wrong thing. He was looking for the wrong thing. Scripture says that he saw there a young Philistine woman. When he returned home, he told his parents, in verse 2, I have seen a Philistine woman. After his parents try and warn him about scoping out Philistine girls, Samson boldly declares, go get her for me. She is the right one for me. And that phrase literally means, she is right in my eyes. You see, God had told them about intermarrying. He had forbidden it. Now, I realize that beauty is only skin deep and ugly goes right to the bone. But good looks will fade. Character is what we should be looking for in people. And Solomon strictly was going by the desires of his eyes. He saw a pretty girl. He was motivated purely by physical appearance. He saw her. She looked good. Now he wants her for his wife. Samson was looking in the wrong place for the wrong thing for the wrong reason. And I talked to folks uh, when I was out in uh, St. Louis at the Southern Baptist. They, they said, where are you from? Where's, your, where's the church? And I said, well, we're in the, in the Baltimore area. Ooh, Baltimore area. <laughs> There's a reputation. 
And I said, well, let me tell you something. Most of the people that get into trouble are someplace they shouldn't be, or someplace they shouldn't be. They're doing something. They're, they're someplace they shouldn't be with someone they shouldn't be with doing something they shouldn't ought to be doing. What the press doesn't tell you is that big rash of killings uh, uh, we had when the Horseshoe Falls, the, the Horseshoe Casino was being built, was a turf war. And they were staking out their territory. And some of the police officers call it a self-cleaning oven. If the druggies and the prostitutes and all of those people want to kill themselves, you know, we're going to follow up on that stuff because the law is still the law. But I'll tell you this, there's a difference, and, and uh, I'm in Brooklyn a lot. We uh, do different things there every, almost every single day. And I have never had a problem because I watch who I'm with. I know who the bad guys are, and I don't mess with them. I stick to myself, I mind my own business. But the other thing is, when the, let's call them the players, as long as the players keep the action between themselves, the police step back a little bit. But when they start getting the citizens involved, they come down on them hard, and they come, they just make their lives even more miserable. So the bottom line is that Samson was in the wrong place, looking for the wrong thing for the wrong reason and he got himself into trouble. Third thing, he rejected godly counsel. Deuteronomy chapter 7, verse 3 and 4 says, Do not intermarry with them. Do not give your daughters to their sons or take their daughters for your sons. That was a time of arranged marriage where the father would go and, and uh, procure a daughter or, uh, excuse me, a daughter-in-law, if you please. It was arranged marriage. And the book of Deuteronomy says, don't intermarry. So far, Samson's made some mistakes, but they're mistakes that can be, can be uh, uh, taken care of. But Samson's rejecting what God said both in Exodus 34, 16. God said it twice. Do not intermarry with unbelievers. That is very important in this day and age for a young man or a young woman who is looking to get married and is looking outside, if they are Christians and they're looking outside the Christian community for a mate, it's going to be problematic. Always has been, always will be, rarely if ever turns out right. The reason is clear. If you marry an unbeliever, he or she will turn you away from the true and living God. The fourth thing, he continued a wrong relationship. It was a wrong relationship. Scripture says he went down to the woman and he liked her. Now, evidently, he'd not met her before now. So it was strictly a physical attraction. He had never met her before, but that doesn't matter because Samson is hormone-driven, not Holy Spirit-driven. This is the Old Testament version of the Doors song, Hello, I love you, won't you tell me your name? Fifth thing, he compromised his commitment. He compromised his commitment. He told neither his father or his mother what he had done. While he was traveling with his parents to make the wedding arrangements, he went off into a vineyard was approached by a lion. He killed the lion with his bare hands. Thereby, two of his vows. One, he was in a vineyard. He wasn't supposed to be in a vineyard. And two, he touched a dead body, a body that he had killed. He told neither his father or his mother. Now, you would think, you know, young, man's, young men are kind of braggarts. Um, and, uh, you know, they do something they think is spectacular. But he didn't tell mom and dad. Why? Because he knew it was wrong. He was someplace he shouldn't have been. He had to do something he shouldn't have done. Look at verse, uh, in verse 9. It says, uh, he's, another time he's traveling alone, and he stops by the vineyard to revisit the scene of this, of this uh, great exploit, and he finds the bees have built a honeycomb inside the dead carcass of the lion. And he scoops out a handful of the honey, 
and he eats it. Again, he's in the vineyard. He shouldn't be there. Touching a dead body, he shouldn't be doing that. Samson was living on the edge, and we're going to see it catches up with him. According to verse 10, Samson made a feast customary for bridegrooms, and the Hebrew word used here means it was a drinking bash. It was a bachelor party. Now, in those days, those bachelor parties went on for about a week. And so Samson is consistently violating the Nazarite vows. Samson is the perfect picture of a, of a believer who is beginning to bail on his commitment to the Lord. You see, if you simply look at his long hair, he appears to be dedicated to God. But his lifestyle and his actions tell a different story. On the outside, he looks like a man of God, but on the inside, he's a man controlled by his lusts. The sixth thing, he ignored his weakness. He ignored his weakness. Judges 14, 7, she, talking about uh, his bride-to-be, cried the whole seven days of the feast. So on the seventh day, he finally told her because she continued to press him. All right, here's what happened. Coming time for the wedding. They're having the bachelor party. They're having the feast. They're having all these things. And one day, Samson swaggers up, and he told a riddle. He told a riddle. He offered a riddle to the 30 Philistine groomsmen that were there. And he said, in verse 14, Out of the eater, something to eat. Out of the strong, something sweet. He said, if you can solve this riddle, I will give you 30 changes of clothing. Now, 30 changes of clothing, 30 new outfits, and he talked about linen outfits. He talked about expensive stuff. Even if you've got Cole's cash in your, part, uh, in your pocket, 30 changes of clothing is a substantial thing. Now, by the fourth day, they couldn't figure it out, and so the groomsmen were getting, getting nervous. So they went to the father and the bride-to-be and said, listen, coax your husband into explaining the riddle so that we don't have this financial hardship. And oh, by the way, if you don't, we're going to burn your house and you in it and your entire family. These were not nice people that Samson was dealing with. Interestingly enough, 20 years later, when Samson was involved with Delilah, a similar situation happened. They, talked to, they told Delilah, find out where his strength is, or we will burn your house and your family and kill everybody in it. Samson could be seduced because he was all hormones and no brain. His weakness was apparent to everybody but him. He never saw his own weakness. He never refused to admit he had a problem. And consequently, he never came to grips with his problem. In the end, it would prove his undoing. He eventually revealed the riddle's answer after his bride-to-be cried for seven days. He told her, she told them, they told the riddle. And he paid off, but uh, he was very, very upset. He was very, very upset. We won't take the time because uh, time is fleeting, but uh, you can read it later. The seventh thing, he'd rather take revenge than repent. He'd rather take revenge than repent. Burning with anger, he returned to his father's home. Now, here's the thing. In this life, somebody will take advantage of you. Somebody will say something they shouldn't have said. They'll take advantage of you. They'll, they'll, and, and revenge will burn in your heart. But the scripture tells us, both in the Old Testament and the New Testament, Deuteronomy 32, 35, and Romans 12, 9, says vengeance belongs to God. Let me tell you something. If someone deserves vengeance, and you take vengeance on them, that lets God off the hook. 
through the years, and it's not easy, but through the years I've had people do me wrong, and I give that over to God. Because you know what I found out? That God can do a whole lot worse to somebody than I can. And my hands are clean. I just turn it over to God. Don't take vengeance on people. In order to pay off his debt, Samson went to another village, killed 30 Philistines, took their clothes off them, and took them and gave them to the groomsmen. Again, violating his vows. His feelings of romance are now replaced with rage and revenge. He leaves his bride standing at the altar. He came back a few, uh, a few weeks later, cooled down a little bit, but the father-in-law had given her to another man. This is starting to sound like a Jerry Springer show. Eh? <laughs> days in the morning. This escalates Samson's revenge to an even greater level now. And you've probably heard the story how he caught 300 foxes and tied their tails together and put a burning torch and let them out in the field and burnt down all the crops of the Philistines. And that revenge, that stuff just builds. You, you know, you hurt me, now I'm going to hurt you worse, and I'm going to hurt you worse. It just, where does it ever stop? All right, quickly. Four mistakes that came from Samson's destructive dalliance with Delilah. Because Delilah was his undoing. He got involved with another wrong relationship. This is the third woman. Delilah was the third Philistine woman, the third unbeliever that, Sam, that uh, Samson dealt with. He toyed with, uh, let me get caught up here, there we go. He toyed with temptation. The choice between Samson and silver was already in Delilah's heart. They said, listen, Delilah, if you don't find out what his what his, where the source of his strength is. If you do, we'll make you a millionaire. You, you, can, read, you can read the dollars in there. We'll make you a multimillionaire. If you don't, we're going to kill you and your whole family and burn everything down. Well, that's not much of a choice. Not much of a choice. And being a woman of no character, she took the easy road, and Samson paid. Samson's fatal attraction was based on sex. Delilah's motivation was based on money. The Philistines were after power. Well, that sounds like Washington, D.C., doesn't it? This trifecta of money, sex, and power has brought many good people to their destruction. All right, third thing quickly. Samson reveals his secret in order to save face. He didn't realize what he had done until it was too late. They cut his hair. She said, the Philistines are upon you. He got up to shake himself, but his strength was gone. They bound him, they put out his eyes, and put him on a mill, just like he was a donkey. All right, quickly, five action steps, and hopefully this will help you in your life, help me in my life, as we try and work through our weaknesses. One, acknowledge your fatal Flaws. Is it lust? Is it coveting? Is it revenge? Unforgiving spirit? Anger? Lying? Psalm 38, 18 says, I confess my iniquity. I am troubled by my sin. Two, admit you need help. Until you admit you are vulnerable, you'll never experience victory. Psalm 34, 17 says, The righteous cry out, and the Lord hears them. He delivers them from all of their troubles. Third thing, avoid temptation. Don't put yourself in situations where you know you're vulnerable. If you have a problem with drinking, don't go to bars. If you have a wandering eye, don't flirt with people. If you have a problem with things on the internet, get an internet filter. Genesis 4, 7 says, sin is crouching at your door. It desires to have you, but you must master it. Number four, ask for help. It's not just enough to acknowledge your problem. You have to admit you need help, but you have to call someone in. Ask someone to pray for you. Ask a friend to, to hold you accountable. 
Ask for God's assistance, first of all. Ask for God's assistance. But then second, ask for the help of others so that people can, can challenge you and hold you accountable. Fifth and finally, assimilate God's truth into your life. Be with God's people, read God's word, and put it into practice. Psalm 119.11 says, I have hidden your word in my heart that I might not sin against you. What's the moral to the story? It really has nothing to do with Samson, and it has everything to do with God. The passage is a living lesson in the grace of God. A man who's beaten, blinded, humiliated by his own stupidity, reached the bottom, turned around, and discovered that God was right there waiting for him the entire time. God is the hero in this story. If you've goofed up your life, and which of us haven't made mistakes, God is ready, willing, and able to help you and to receive you to himself. Scripture tells us that all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God, each and every one of us. But the Scripture also tells us, but whosoever calls on the name of the Lord shall be saved. I hope that we'll learn some lessons from Samson, apply them to our lives, and how, I, how we might be more effective to do what God wants us to do and the reason we're here. Let's all stand together and pray. Lord, we're thankful for the opportunity to come and hear your word. We just pray that you help us to take these truths into our heart. That we see someone who had such great potential and such promise and had everything going for him, but he blew it on foolish stuff. We pray, Lord, you'd help us not to do that. Be with us now as we, we have a, a song of invitation. If there's one here that needs to make a decision for you today, that this would be the day. In your name we ask. Amen. Let your mace hang.